we're Irish, we're gay, we should be looking for our rights and we should form a political movement. Today, as part of our online shout-out interview series, we're speaking to Senator David Norris, who's arguably Ireland's best-known gay man. Senator Norris has been involved in the gay rights movement since it began, and it was the winning of his case in 1988 in the European Court of Human Rights that led to the decriminalisation of homosexuality in Ireland in 1993. What role did you partake in the Irish gay rights movement? The very beginning was 1969. I saw an advertisement at the back of the Observer newspaper that said, homosexual, curious... Send 10 shillings post Laura and a stamp to test envelope to 28A Kennedy Street, Manchester. So I did, despite the fact that all my friends said, you're mad, it's blackmail and all this kind of stuff. So I did change my name. I became Alfred J. O'Neill. Oh, I used a fake name as well. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was Daniel Gallagher. <laughs> but Alfred, yeah. me, D- Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's what I did. And I, I got information back, but it was all, of course, naturally. About England, so gradually my interest died out. And then, um, around about 1970-ish, uh, there was a thing created here called the Southern Ireland Civil Rights Association. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was formed to provide um, support and reassurance for the Roman Catholics and Nationalists in the North of Ireland who were under pressure, they were discriminated against and so on. And that was grand, the first meeting came, and it was so smug and so self-congratulatory, I couldn't bear it. They kept saying, oh, of course, it's terrible up in the north, but we don't discriminate at all down here. And I knew they did, because I knew they discriminated against gay people. There was one motive. The other motive was, there was a very handsome young Dutchman on the other side of the room, and I thought, <laughs> how can I raise the flag and say, woo? <laughs> so I stood up and I denounced them, and I attacked them, and I said, yes, there is discrimination. I know about it because I am homosexual. We didn't have a word gay at that stage. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I fought with them. We had a great long argument. And eventually I persuaded them to um, uh, accept reform of the criminal law mm-hmm. uh, as part of their um, baggage. Uh, and they were the first organisation ever mm-hmm. in Ireland to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't do anything about it, but however. And then about a year later or so, there was a big conference on sexuality organised by the student welfare people, Mm -hmm. officers. Mm -hmm. They'd had a meeting up in the north, but they brought a big monster meeting on sexuality to Trinity, to the Regent House room. It's a big room over the front gate of Trinity. Mm -hmm. An enormous Regency room. And it turned out the whole meeting was about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. And we decided to start various organisations like the Sexual Libera- Liberation Movement, the Union for Sexual Freedoms in Ireland, and so on. Uh, now, we also set up a counselling service, mm-hmm. for which I invented the name, oh. Telefriend, <laughs> TAF, Telefriend. Then the Sexual Liberation Movement met once a week in a little garret in number four, Trinity College, Dublin. Mm-hmm. So I eventually got fed up with this and I said, look, come on, what's going on here? We're, we're gay. Uh, we're Irish, we're gay, we should be looking for our rights and we should form a political movement. Mm -hmm. And those are the four elements Mm -hmm. that gave the name Mm -hmm. to the Irish gay rights movement. Mm -hmm. And we started that Irish gay rights movement as a specifically gay campaigning organisation. We decided to have a record hop. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought about 30, 40 people might come. 250 people Mm -hmm. came, it was amazing. So we saw the possibility of that, so we set up regular discos, or as regular as we could get. Mm-hmm. And um, eventually, we got a building in Parnell Square. We rented a whole building. So we had wine and cheese parties, we had a publishing house, we had a legal department where we looked after people who were caught by the police, because there, there was active police harassment of gay mm-hmm. people, and they'd uh, find uh, gay people in the, in the act of having sex, and they'd uh, arrest them and charged them. Mm-hmm. And there weren't that many, but there were enough. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But the principal, the money was generated by the discotheque. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, that was grand, and that worked quite pretty well. Why did you become Ireland's first publicly known openly gay man? In those days, nobody could afford to speak out. Mm-hmm. Nobody could be afford to be identified. When I did the first 
television interview with a gay man ever in Ireland in 1975, um, RTE said they would uh, film me back to the camera in shadow with my voice disguised. And I said, well, in that case, I won't do it. Because the whole point is to show that I'm an ordinary person. If I'm in shadow at the back of the camera in a voice disguised, I come across as a monster, and I don't want to. What would you say to people who would um, regard a homosexual as a, a perverted person or an immoral person? The word perverted, again, carries emotive connotations. And usually the type of person who uses uh, a word like perverted uh, is using it to uh, project their own feeling of dislike of the homosexual, which is irrational and uh, emotional, and is not in fact a scientific or clinical uh, way of looking at things at all. You were one of the founders of one of the first gay community centres in Ireland, the Hirschfeld Centre in Temple Bar. Tell us about that. So I continued on with um, a group that I called the uh, Campaign for Homosexual Law Reform. CHLR. Mm -hmm. It consisted of five or six people, uh, volunteers, uh, half a drawer in my filing cabinet in my office in Trinity, and some headed notepaper where I had persuaded friends of mine, like the Dean of St. Patrick's, mm -hmm. uh, Victor Griffin, uh, the playwright, Hugh Leonard, mm -hmm. the former Minister for Health, Dr. Noel Brown, mm -hmm. uh, to, to appear on the notepaper as patrons. Wonderful, it had a marvelous impact because we were immediately denounced as in the newspapers as an international conspiracy funded by Jewish money from New York. Oh. I mean, if they'd only known, but there was only half a dozen of us, <laughs> and all we had was half a filing cabinet and some no <laughs> head of no paper, but we were an international conspiracy. Yeah. It really gave us status. Yes, yes. People then got after me uh, and kept asking me to to find another place, to get another disco going and so on. So eventually I found number 10 Found Street. And that is what started the whole of Temple Bar. There was absolutely nothing in Temple Bar before the Hirschfeld Centre, as I called it, yeah. after Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, who was a victim of Hitler's reign of terror, mm -hmm. who was a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. So I found this building in 10 Found Street. We opened it as a discotheque on St. Patrick's Day, 1979. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I thought, again, a couple hundred people, but 350 people got in. There were another 350 out in the street mm -hmm. trying to push the door in to get in. <laughs> Sounds like a George on a Saturday night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there were no places like the George in those yeah, times. Yeah, of course, See, we yeah. were the only resource. Yes, yes. We started the discotheque, but there was deflection on the beams, and a structural engineer said to me, look, uh, this is dangerous. So I stopped the dancing, okay. and I got booed until somebody stood up and said, hold on a minute, why are you booing? At least as somebody who cares about our welfare. Mm -hmm. So within a period of six weeks, we got the business rectified. Mm -hmm. We put up supports and all this reopened again. Immensely popular, immensely successful. We had in there, we had a discotheque, mm -hmm. a restaurant, a library, wow. uh, a cinema. Really? Yes. My goodness. And in the cinema, it could turn into a theatre. We put on reviews and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it was a real social centre. And we also did discotheques for uh, women's issues, and environmental issues and so on. And that brought lots of vibrant young people in. Mm -hmm. And they saw the possibilities mm -hmm. of uh, this area. Mm -hmm. And that's what really lifted Temple Bar up, was our mm -hmm. discotheques. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there were several attacks on it. On one occasion, uh, I was working upstairs, flat asphalt roof with plexiglass domes, and I saw flickering. And I thought, oh, something short circuit. And I went up, and somebody had poured petrol all over the roof. Oh my God. And they'd got two barrels of petrol, and in between it, they put a milk churn full of explosive, and they'd thrown up fire lighters to set the roof ablaze. And the idea was to heat the roof up, blow the roof off, and send sheets of burning petrol down the walls. So about three or four hundred people would have been killed. But to death would have been much worse than the stardust. But I had gone up to investigate with some fire extinguishers and I just went on automatic pilot and got the fire extinguishers and got them out, got yeah. the blaze out and called the police. Meanwhile, the disco went on. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's shocking, absolutely oh. shocking. Oh my God. So eventually, after about 10 years, there was another arson attack and I was got out of my bed at 2 o'clock in the morning as a key holder 
I came down, I ascertained that the, um, the archives were safe, that nobody was injured, and that the insurance was in place. Once I knew those three things, I was happy. Yes. And one of the little disco bunnies fluttered up to me and said, how can you possibly stand there with a smile on your face and our beautiful disco in ruins? <laughs> and I said, I can only refer to the late and great Dr. Samuel Johnson when his house went on fire in London. He had his manservant put out a table, a chair, and a bottle of Madeira and a glass. <laughs> and uh, he was enjoying his drink and watching the fire when Boswell came along and reprimanded him and said, how can, fie, how can you be so heartless? And Johnson just said, sir, can a man not warm his hands at his own fire? <laughs> So that was my <laughs> approach. You remain positive all the time, don't you, David? Ah, yes, <laughs> yes. How did the legal movement that led to the decriminalisation of homosexuality begin? I had thought originally, from my work in the legal department of the, of the movement, that perhaps one of the people who were arrested would take a, a, um, a constitutional defence, mm -hmm. but they didn't, because none of them wanted any more publicity. They just wanted to go away and have it all forgotten as mm -hmm. much as they could. Uh, a lot of them were very respectable people, professional people, married people, and all this kind of stuff. So you can understand their Definitely. anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we started to build a case around me. Mm -hmm. And my difficulty was finding what they call locus standi. Mm. Uh, finding a reason to attack the bill. To, I had to show that I had been personally affected by it. Luckily, ten years previously, I had had uh, a collapse in Switzer's restaurant and everybody thought it was heart and they got the heart ambulance took me to, to Baker Street Hospital and um, they found out my heart was perfectly all right mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the it came out that I was gay and they sent me to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist oh. said um, oh the laws in this country are very severe and they will be very damaging to your mental health I would advise you for the sake of your health to go and live in South France so it annoyed me, but it also gave me the local standout for the case. Mm. So we got into court, into the high court, and what I added to that was uh, witnesses. Mm -hmm. I insisted on witnesses, and I went all around, all over the world, getting witnesses. So we had the president of the American Psychiatric Association at the time when uh, homosexuality was declassified as an illness, mm -hmm. it was removed from being an illness. We had the Regis Professor of Forensic Psychiatry in the University of Cambridge, we had um, Rose Robertson, uh, we had Father Michal McGray, we had all kinds of witnesses, so that day after day, the silence that had existed, because homosexuality was an unmentionable concept. Mm -hmm. It was never referred to, absolutely never mentioned, never referred to. And it was for that reason that people in my generation, all of us have the same experience, growing up thinking you're the only one. Because there's nothing about it in the media or anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to blow that away, and we did. And a great gift of the gab, quite clearly. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is, Kay, I, uh, people have this wonderfully coloured view of what I do. They think I live in some kind of perpetual orgy, I think. <laughs> and I do remember, I was terribly amused um, that uh, I heard, discovered that one person had said, uh, which I thought was extremely funny and quite charming, um, because I had proposed one time a hostel for third level students in George Street and somebody in the area got hold of this and was in terrible dander over it and said, that fella coming in here, hostels for homosexuals in Aaron Heights area. And me with two daughters. I mean... <laughs> and the judgment we got in the High Court was quite a good one. The judge accepted our evidence. Uh, accepted that there were a really large number of gay people mm -hmm. in Ireland, that we weren't child molesters, we weren't less intelligent, all this sort of stuff. But then at the end of it, he took a swerve and he said, nevertheless, despite all this, uh, I have to, because of the Christian and democratic nature of the state, I have to find against the plaintiff. So we went off to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. where we got a very bad judgment. In fact, it's defective in law mm -hmm. from the Chief Justice O'Higgins, because all you're supposed to deal with in a Supreme Court appeal is... Uh, technical matters arising from the evidence given in the junior court, mm -hmm. in, the, in the high court. But he wandered all over the place, introducing all kinds of ideas that uh, gay people spread disease and that gay people need to be frightened into marriage because they were on the borders and a bit of pressure wouldn't do them any harm. 
and all this kind of nonsense. Yeah. Uh, but there were two dissenting judgments. There were two other judges agreed with him without adding any reason, which is very cowardly in my opinion. Uh, but there were two very good dissenting judgments, mm -hmm. uh, Henshi, Jay, and McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And they dealt with uh, questions of privacy and questions of locus standi and all this kind of stuff. And Henshi in particular said that I should have, that I obviously won because mm -hmm. I won a walkover mm -hmm. because uh, I had introduced all the evidence mm -hmm. and the government had signally failed to provide any evidence at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it should have been a walkover. The Supreme Court gave its verdict on David Norris's constitutional action. By a three to two majority, it upheld the existing law. It does appear as if the state is either unwilling or unable uh, to protect the rights of individual citizens who are homosexual in this country. It also, I think, uh, does raise a question about the Irish constitution. So we then went off to Europe and we won in Europe by one vote mm -hmm. with the Irish judge voting against us. Oh, really? I didn't yes. realise that. Wow. Mr. J Brian Walsh. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes, he was a bully. So that led to a situation where it had been declared a breach of fundamental human rights by the European Court. The Irish government did nothing about it for five years, but at the end of that five years, they did. And it was very good because it was a woman who was in charge of it, Maura Gagan Quinn. Yes. Uh, she was Minister for Justice. And the opposition tried to introduce... Uh, narrow, mean-minded amendments, mm -hmm. which would have created, for example, uh, a difference in age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so you had to be older to engage in gay sexual activity. Mm -hmm. And um, she listened to that, and then she stood up and she said something that was quite remarkable. She said, uh, as a minister in the Irish government, I would need clear, cogent and factual reasons mm -hmm. to introduce any measure, measure of discrimination against an Irish citizen. Mm -hmm. None such have been provided. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I am not accepting these amendments. Mm -hmm. And that's the golden rule. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that altered the law. And I went on. You brought the first civil partnership bill to the Oireachtas. Can you tell us more about that? Everything in that law, I avoided the word marriage. Because at that stage, uh, marriage would have raised a red rag. Mm -hmm. But Section 7 governed the entire bill, and Section 7 simply said, any positive effect deriving from the state of marriage shall also be held to derive from this new state. Mm -hmm. In other words, it had absolute equality with marriage, so it was marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, that was left in suspended animation after a very vigorous debate. Uh, Labour Party introduced one, government then introduced one, and it was a move in the right direction, but it was seriously defective. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are 167 differences between that and marriage, negative differences. The language in which it was couched was disgusting mm -hmm. in terms of heterosexual civil partners. The house was described as the family home, mm -hmm. whereas for gay people, it was the shared accommodation. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't allow gay people to be a family. Yeah, and this, yeah. There were all these sort of things. So I denounced it. Mm -hmm. Eventually... Uh, we got something uh, considerably better. And then, many years previously, I had been debating in Trinity, and there was a woman called Mina Bano Cribben, mm -hmm. and she came up to me and she said, We know you! You won't be satisfied with the change in the, the criminal law. The next thing you'll be after is homosexual marriage. And I said, What a wonderful idea! Thank you very much, Adam. <laughs> Can I, I'll make a note of that. If you have any further suggestions, please let me know. <laughs> So it's thanks to her, then we have Marjorie Colley today. Well, she played, <laughs> she played a role. <laughs> we then came along, we had the referendum on marriage equality, and that was very successful, and it was wonderful. And the person who's largely forgotten in all this is Eamon Gilmore. Mm -hmm. and Eamon Gilmore was leader of the Labour Party, mm -hmm. and he insisted on marriage equality being part of the programme for government. Mm -hmm. He absolutely insisted. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in Ender Kenny's mind at all. In fact, in the beginning, Ender Kenny was quite opposed to it. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of thanks to give to Eamon Gilmore. Mm -hmm. But it's not often the people who did the work yeah. who were up on the lorries yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> at That's, the rallies yeah. and stuff. And who would say you were the biggest opponents when you were taking your legal cases? Oh, the church. The church. Yes, mm. the church. I mean, I was read off the altar at Easter. And 
<laughs> Not by name, but it's perfectly obvious who they're thinking of. Yeah, the Irish you know, homosexuals. Certain leaders who <laughs> will uh, mislead people into temptation and into thinking that homosexuality is all right when it's not really, it's a grave sin and mm. all this kind of stuff, yeah. And fundamentalists mm -hmm. f of, of all sorts, mm -hmm. you know, Catholic and Protestant fundamentalists were the biggest opponents. And were there certain individuals, like maybe certain political figures or certain church officials, who were really like the spokesperson, who were just really denouncing you at every single turn they could? Yeah, I remember being on, on a television programme, and I saw it again recently, and I... I for the first time, I recognised being a priest up at the back who spent the whole time denouncing me and attacking homosexuality and all the rest of it. I saw a clip on Reeling Back the Years and I realised who he was. He was, he was the pre that priest. He was involved in the serial abuse of children in the Wexford Diocese and was imprisoned for it subsequently. And he was the one being all holy and attacking me over homosexuality. Did you suffer intimidation for your involvement? Not really. I mean, I, I got violently abusive letters yeah, and, yeah. and phone calls and this sort of business. Uh, no, I didn't get very much. I, I, did, I did get attacked in the street mm -hmm. uh, a couple of times. But the worst, the worst violence uh, was during the presidential election mm -hmm. where uh, one, uh, I think he was a councillor, mm -hmm. uh, attacked me physically in the street. The police had to be called. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Because... Uh, uh, he was giving the impression to people and perhaps he had it himself that I was involved in paedophilia in some way because this was part of this, the slander during the presidential election. Mm -hmm. It's amazing the change Ireland's come out in the last oh, few years. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, I was in the Senate with, with several gay, gay senators. Dominic Hannigan, yeah. was very nice fellow. John Lyons was a TD. Yes, Lovely. Yeah. And they were also, they were young, they were energetic, they were good looking. Mm -hmm. And that, whatever people say, makes a difference. Yeah. I mean, a well-presented, happy, balanced, articulate gay person, that's the best yeah. way of changing public opinion. Yeah. See, like, even when I was like, in school, when I was like, 13, 14, there was such negativity around being gay. You know, you're a queer, you're a faggot, constant name-calling. And oh. now I know, in the school I went to, which is a traditional rural Catholic school, there's openly gay students who are 16 years old. And for me, the thought of if I was openly gay at 16, I would have been lynched. I would have been lynched in oh, yeah. goal. And it's unbelievable. And that's only in, what, 10 years? It's, I know, it's wonderful. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. When you were involved in those early days in the movement, what kind of in future did you envisage for gay people in Ireland? Well, the main thing uh, was to get rid of the criminal law. Mm -hmm. That was the real target in those days. Because the criminal law was there. It had a very bad effect on people. Um, because it led to guilt, shame, furtiveness, uh, the inability to conduct relationships, because if you had a relationship, it became visible, and once it became visible, you could be subject to the police, you could go to jail, uh, you would lose your job, you'd lose your family, you'd be kicked out of the church, social death, terrible, terrible. I mean, people nowadays have no conception of the agonies of fear that people went through. They were terrified, yeah. absolutely terrified. When you were involved in those days, what kind of future did well, you Well, I felt that the criminal law was absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. And I said, we've got to start. There, there are several stages in this. The first stage is getting rid of the criminal law. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything until you get rid of the criminal law. And, I mean, the criminal law was used, even until fairly recently, I mean, the Hirschfeld Centre started the whole of Temple Bar. Every single group, from children's groups to women's groups to postcard shops, all got grants in Temple Bar, with the single exception of the Hirschfeld Centre. Mm -hmm. And we were the group that started it. Mm -hmm. And what was quoted back to me when I applied for grants was, we can't encourage criminal activity. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing. Stage one was get rid of the criminal law, and stage two then was building on the positive human rights aspects. Mm -hmm like the right to civil partnership, then the right to marriage, and all this kind of stuff. It was all incremental. Are you surprised where gay rights are today in Ireland? I'm very pleased. Mm. I'm very pleased. I mean, here I am on my own here. Uh, I spent so much time pushing the boat out that I forgot to jump on, and the next thing I saw, the little boat was steaming out of the harbour with people waving at me. <laughs> but the reward is, I mean, a few months ago, I saw two handsome, athletic, well-set-up young men going across O'Connell Bridge hand in hand. Mm. 
Mm. And I thought that's what it was all about. That that makes it all worthwhile. Are you surprised though? Did you ever think we'd get to the stage? Did you ever think you'd see this? I don't know that I saw exactly this, but I did see a society in which gay men would be accepted. Gay life for men and women mm-hmm. would be acceptable mm-hmm. and not the awful disease that it was previously characterised as, as it was characterised as both a sin, it was a crime, and it was a disease. Those are very negative things to put into an adolescent's mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's no wonder there were so many suicides. Mm-hmm. For a 16-year-old yeah. with the hormones whizzing around yeah. to be told that those are, those are the three words that describe you, sin, disease, and crime. And that doesn't exist anymore.